So, you are here tonight because of a book called Revelation. Now, when you think of the book of Revelation, what do you think of? What is the image in your mind that you get? Is it a good image? Is it happy thoughts? <laughs> I was just thinking of a movie called Apocalypse Now. It's not a really good movie, I don't recommend it, but it was a famous movie. And the word apocalypse means revelation. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But, you know, the reason we're saying revelation is not because it is a confusing or scary book. It is because I believe, and we believe, there is a message of hope and encouragement to everyone living in the world today. And certainly as we come to the end of the world, it feels like everybody thinks that the end is coming. Um, people are concerned about all the things that are going to happen. So, in this seminar, I'm hoping that we're going to dispel this notion that Revelation is a scary book, that it's a book of scary things, of scary beasts. Instead, Revelation is going to be about learning who Jesus Christ is and what does it have to do with us today. So, let's talk a little bit about the book, the book of Revelation. Who wrote Revelation? Who knows who wrote Revelation? John, yeah, the disciple John, the son, the son of Saturday, he was one of the uh, disciples of Jesus, one of the part, a part of his inner circle. Now, John also wrote the Gospel of John and a few other uh, books in the Bible, three other epistles, letters. Now, we're told that John was a witness. Now, when you hear the word witness, you think of a court proceeding. Right? Oh, what did John witness? Well, John actually says that he witnessed. This is in 1 John 1, 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So John sees himself as a witness. And when we read Revelation, you're going to see that John uses that word witness again and again. And in fact, the revelator, the one that gives us the revelation, also is a faithful witness. So what do we know about Revelation? Well, Revelation was written by John while he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Now, if you have been to that part of the world, you would know that Patmos, even today, it's not a very interesting island. In fact, the only reason people go to Patmos is because John was there at one point, and this is where he wrote Revelation. Um, so it was not supposed to be a nice Greek island for, for you to relax. It was supposed to be a prison colony for the Romans. And while he was living in this prison colony, John receives the visions of Revelation. And that's really interesting because you would not think that this is a place where you would want to write your magnus opus. <laughs> But certainly, this little island in the middle of the Aegean is where John saw Jesus and he received this vision and this revelation that we're going to read about. Now, it is during this time that the Christians in Asia Minor, by the way, we're going to have a map in a minute. Asia Minor is modern Turkey, Western Turkey today. Uh, as Rob was saying, I lived there for many years. Uh, it's a very beautiful place to live. However, uh, it's kind of hot, <laughs> and um, the Christians that live in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey today, they had a difficult time because they were not willing to worship the emperor. Now, during the time of John is when you really begin to see those famous persecutions of the Christians that you've heard about. You see movies about Christians being in the circus, uh, being eaten by, by bees, burned at the stake. All these things began to happen right around the time when John writes the book of Revelation. So that also is very significant because if you're thinking about what the author had in mind when he wrote these symbols and these images and these visions, well, he was thinking about the things happening to the Christians living in Asia Minor at the time. So it was likely written, written during the reign of the mission uh, about 95 uh, AD, we said. And this was the beginning of widespread Christian persecution across the empire. Can everybody hear me? Um, so here's an interesting question. Why is Revelation written in symbols? This is a little bit frustrating, isn't it? We wish we would just be told, if Revelation is about the events in the last days, why can't God just tell us what he meant? 
why can't we just understand what the symbols mean? Well, um, I believe Confucius said that a picture is worth a thousand words. A picture is worth a thousand words. So you can say more with an image than you can with words. I think we know that today, especially that we have the internet. Uh, you guys are familiar with memes. <laughs> this is, there's a reason memes have an image attached to it, right? You could write a little something, but the image actually tells you the real story. So, Revelation is written in a code uh, that is represented by certain images and symbols. However, it's very important that we recognize that this code was meant to be decipherable. It was not meant to be a mystery, to remain a mystery. Now, the prophecies of Revelation, we're going to learn, are going to expose certain oppressive and tyrannical political and religious powers throughout history. So you can see why it was a wise choice to use symbols instead of actually saying what God was saying about these tyrannical powers. So God was very merciful in using symbols to um, make it less likely for the people of God to be persecuted. Already they were facing persecution, persecution. So it was a good thing that those symbols are actually hiding the real meaning uh, of, of God's word. Now, we're going to, I'm just going to put this out there, but uh, we don't, we're not going to have time to really properly deal with this, but let's just say that there are many different ways that people have interpreted the book of Revelation, uh, different approaches, and we're going to look especially at the last approach. Now, there are some very good reasons why we, why we like the last approach, but you're going to see, what we're going to do is we're going to use that last approach, and at the end, I'm going to come back, and then we're going to, at the end of the, the series, we're going to come back and we're going to see is this actually the correct approach? We can ask the question, is the historicist approach the best one to use on Revelation? And I think by the end of the series, you're gonna say, is there any other way? <laughs> okay, so very important. We need, to, we need to discuss what we call hermeneutics. Uh, theologians call it hermeneutics. Uh, but really, it's just the principles of interpretation. The book of Revelation claims to be a book of prophecy. What is prophecy? It's a very important question, isn't it? Now, prophecy comes from the word prophet. And what does a prophet do? Prophecy. They prophesize, very good. Uh-huh. You, you can just say it aloud? Yeah, I think it's probably not an answer on thing. From God, an individual to where he wants this individual to prophesy to people that, is being, that need to be inspired from the word of God. Right, so let me repeat what you just said. A prophet is told by God what he should say, right? This is what you said. A prophet is told by God. This is exactly right. Uh, if you look at the etymology of the word, the source of the word prophecy, the prophet, it actually means that. I think a lot of people say, well, a prophet is somebody that tells the future. And that is something that prophets can do, but in general, especially if you look at the word in Hebrew, the word just means someone that speaks for God. Someone that's received something to say from God. So that's what prophecy is. It's something that came from God, a special message from God. Now, the message of Revelation was primarily written for its contemporary readers. Um, we talked about how um, this, the churches of Revelation, we're gonna read that, uh, we're gonna look at that tomorrow. The churches of Revelation, where were they located? Where they were located exactly where John the Apostle was living. Um, in fact, the, the church of Ephesus was his church. We're gonna look at that tomorrow. So the message of the book of Revelation was written for real Christians living in real churches in the first century AD. This is very important because there are some people that say, well, Revelation was written entirely symbolic. Uh, there's no way to really know what God meant. It was just supposed to be some difficult, mysterious, uh, you know, something hidden, a sealed book. Uh, but in fact, the message of Revelation was written for real people, for them to understand which tells us that it is possible to understand 
the message of Revelation, right? If it was intended for them to understand it, uh, for the Christians in John's day to understand it, then certainly we should be able to understand it today. So, we can expect that there's going to be a lot of symbols in Revelation, a lot of imagery drawn from the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. Now, why might that be? Well, John had Scriptures. For his day, it was not the New Testament, it was the Law and the Prophets. I'm going to come back to that. But John drew his imagery, his language, the references that, he, uh, that you're going to see in Revelation. They all come from the Scriptures that John the Apostle had at the time. And by the way, this is also the reason why the Christians at the time could understand John's message, right? Because they have the same sources. They had the same sources in order to be able to interpret the book of Revelation. Uh, in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, God says, Remember the forming things of all, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. So this is one of the things that we expect God to be able to do for us, to declare the end from the beginning. If God indeed knows everything, if God can see the future, then it stands to reason that his prophets and his prophecy would, would declare things concerning the future. So we're going to start now with the questions that you have in front of you. Now if you want to follow along and fill them out, um, you can do that. Um, but certainly, uh, if you want, just want to listen and look at the slides, you can also do that. Uh, but these are the questions that you have in front of you concerning the first presentation. So, what is the title given to the last book of the Bible? Well, it says here, Revel the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, you will be surprised how many people miss the first part of that, the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we think of the apocalypse, of apocalypse, we think of the destruction of the world. We think of the end times. We think about all the scary things that we think are going to happen. But the revelation of Jesus Christ is the reason this book exists. Right? Keep that in mind. It's not there to scare you. It's not there to make you afraid. This book was given to John. This prophecy was for us to be able to understand who Jesus Christ is to us and what he is doing, by the way, this is important, what he is doing today, you know, what is Jesus doing today? Well, that's a good question. And the book of Revelation tells us exactly what Jesus is doing in heaven. So the word revelation comes from the Greek apocalypse, or actually apocalypsis, uh, which means literally uncovering or unveiling. Now, I can get into the, the, the Greek, the, the parts of the Greek, but let's just say, that it means that it's, going, it, it's a revealing of something that is hidden or a secret. Again, very important. Why would you call a book Revelation if everything in the book was supposed to be undecipherable, unknowable, sealed, right? Doesn't make any sense. The, the, the book exists to reveal the secrets that God has. And in the New Testament, by the way, the word apocalypse, it's always used exclusively with reference to God. So God is the one that sends an apocalypse, a revelation, always. It's God is the only one that can reveal the secrets. So, to whom did God give this book? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which... God gave him. So, the revelation is from Jesus, but it was given to Jesus by God. Now, Amos 3.7 says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So this is consistent with what we know about God. Why did God give this book to Jesus? to show his servants things that must surely take place. So, revelation is a revelation of Jesus, from Jesus, because it unveils God's plans for his people and for the world. What 
chain of communication that God used to give this book. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So that word signified, it's kind of important, right? Because signified literally means to explain by using symbols or signs, right? So in other words, the book of Revelation paints an image, it paints a picture of the future events that God has in store for humanity. So it's supposed to paint a picture. It signifies, it reveals through signs. What you see, Revelation 1 and 11, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So again, these are real churches. Uh, in fact, today you can go to Turkey and take a tour of the seven churches. I know because I've done that. <laughs> I've given tours. Um, these are, you know, well, only Smyrna and, let me see, Sardis. Uh, only Smyrna and Sardis actually have people living there still. Uh, there's a little like a parking lot in, in the city of uh, uh, Izmir today, uh, where you can go and see what the city of Smyrna used to be like. But these are real churches. This is very important, right? Because people say, okay, Revelation is a book of symbols, therefore nothing about it can be literal. Well, these churches were literal churches, and they existed at the time of John. And as we said earlier, John was actually a pastor, a minister, for the church of Ephesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. Do you recall anyone in the New Testament, in the Bible, saying, he who has an ear, let him hear? There was somebody that used to say that a lot, right? Jesus. So here he is in his, in his book of Revelation. Jesus' Revelation says, he who has an ear, let him hear. So, let us hear what Jesus has to say. Um, so here's the chain of communication. God gave the revelation to Jesus. Jesus sent it and signified by his angel. His angel sent it to his servant John. And John bore witness, or he wrote it. The Spirit says to the churches. So there's a lot of information here, right? Who is involved here? Well, God. Jesus, and there's an angel, and then there's John, and then finally, and most importantly, the Spirit is the one that speaks to the churches. So, this actually is a revelation of how things work from God's side, right? There's a word of God, and the word was written by the prophets, given from God, through Jesus and the angels. However, it is the Spirit that speaks to the churches. And it is the Spirit that actually is going to reveal to us what the book of Revelation actually has to say. Let's keep that in mind. Upon whom is a special blessing promise. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, here's another uh, connection to Jesus. That word blessed is makarios in Greek. Now, do you remember a part in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, where Jesus started saying, blessed are those who do this, blessed are the wicked spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We call these the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. Did you know that in the book of Revelation, there are Beatitudes? Hmm. There are seven times in the book of Revelation where Jesus says, blessed are those, and then he gives us uh, who it is. In this case, he says, blessed he who reads, and those who hear. And there's going to be six other times in Revelation. We're going to see those. Uh, the Beatitudes of Revelation. By the way, the word blessed is, uh, literally means happy. And Jesus saying, you shall have happiness. And not just kind of like a regular type of happiness. It's a deep, inner joy that you get when you listen to the words of this prophecy, and you keep the words that Jesus is telling. So, 
the threefold blessing is this. He who reads, they that hear, and keep those things which are written therein. In order to be happy, truly, deeply happy, when we read Revelation, we need to do this. These three things, right? I think the problem is sometimes we just read. We just do the first part. And then we just look at those symbols and say, wow, this is a scary book. I don't think I want to read this. But if we obey what Jesus says, read here and then keep those things which are written therein, then you shall be blessed. Very good. Who gave the prophets the messages from God? Well, 2 Peter 1.21 says, Holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, very important. The source of the inspiration for the prophecies and for the book of Revelation is the Spirit of God. How much of Scripture given by God is inspired? Yeah, very good. Yeah, this is kind of important too, right? Because if it turns out that there's a part of Scripture that is not inspired, we have a problem. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all the Scripture is inspired. And certainly all of the book of Revelation is inspired too. That's kind of important. We have to remember that, especially when we read those difficult passages. All Scripture is inspired. What warning is given concerning the interpretation of prophecy? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You know, the next verse says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So again, it is the Holy Spirit that actually inspires John to write. It is the Holy Spirit that, that inspired all the people that wrote the Bible. And certainly the words of Revelation are inspired by the Spirit of God. And it is only by the Spirit that we can hope to understand the meaning of this book. What happens to anyone who asks to the book of Revelation? Ah. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book, Revelation, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. We haven't read the plagues yet, but suffice it to say, uh, we don't want that. <laughs> so, we are trying to stick only to the text. This is also a principle of interpretation, right? We want only the text to tell us what it means. What happens to anyone who takes away from Revelation? Revelation 22, 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So all those blessings, right, that you're going to lose those. So don't take anything from this book. Read it exactly as it's meant to be read. Again, sometimes we want to read the parts that are happy and leave out the rest. But God says, you have to take it all. It is all a revelation. And you want to be blessed by reading it, you have to take all of it together. Now, the Holy Scriptures, uh, for the Apostle, we said, was the Hebrew Bible. So the Law and the Prophets. And it stands to reason that when John was writing his own prophecy by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when he was writing his own prophecy, he would look to the scriptures that he knew, right? To his own prophets. And he drew from those prophets the language and imagery of uh, Revelation. So it says here, um, about 70% of all the references and quotations in the book of Revelation come directly from the Old Testament, we call it the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. That is a big, big part of it, right? I think that gives us already, a, you know, a big um, source of, how should we say, if you really want to know what John was thinking about when he wrote Revelation, well, you need to look at the Old Testament. This is what, this is what he was on his mind. The key to understanding Revelation symbols is knowing the Old Testament history and background. Um, we're going to talk about the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, let me put the other. Uh, oops. 
we got to talk about the Battle of Armageddon. But I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, when you hear when you hear about the Battle of Armageddon, what do you think about? Well, a few years ago during the Cold War, people said, "Well, Russia, right? Russia, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is going to invade the Middle East, or China is going to do something." And so this is a clear example of what people were thinking about. And when they read the passages of the Bible that talk about Armageddon, they said, okay, surely it has to do with the Soviet Union, with China. Uh, today, what we would say, probably still Russia. Uh, but here is the key, right? John would not have known anything about the Soviet Union. Now, it is possible for us to say, okay, well, you know, in a, there's another fulfillment somewhere else where the Soviet Union comes in. But we have to still explain what the people that read this book at the time of John would have understood, right? This is very important. Whatever John wrote, what he had in his mind when he wrote these things, there has to be an interpretation. There has to be a meaning that he had in his mind. And we want to know what he was thinking about because that is the key to applying all of the prophecies in Revelation. We have to recognize that for John, the events in the Bible, the historical events, the prophecies, all these major events that we know, the creation, the flood, the exodus, all these things were in John's mind when he was writing the words of Revelation. And we want to understand the meaning that John had for his prophecy. We have to know this event. We have to know the biblical history. And we have to know the verses. So God intended for us to use the stories of prophecies of the Bible as the cipher to decode the symbolic language of Revelation. Revelation. The cipher to decode the language is found in the Bible. And that too is a biblical principle, biblical principle of interpretation. For precept must be upon precept line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So this is a very old principle, coming all the way from the prophet Isaiah. When you want to understand what scripture has to say, you have to go to the rest of scripture. Because even though there are many authors to the Bible, there's only one spirit, there's only one God, and he is consistent. So if you want to know what Revelation has to say, you have to look at the scriptures. How did Jesus interpret prophecy? Oh, here's a good example, right? If Jesus is the one that gave the revelation to John, we want to know how Jesus thought about prophecy. In Luke 24, 27, and 32, this is after Jesus uh, resurrected. And he was on his way, well, he was walking along with his disciples to, the, to Emmaus. This is on the day of his resurrection. And his disciples did not recognize him. But Jesus is talking to them, and in order to explain to them, now Jesus could have just said, hey, it's me, Jesus. But instead, he says, I'm going to give you a Bible study. I'm going to take you to the scriptures. I'm going to walk you to the scriptures, to the Old Testament. And after I'm done, you're going to see that everything I've told you to believe about me is true. So Jesus was not expecting us to just take his word for granted. He wanted us to look at the scriptures and see what the scripture says and see if they correlated to what Jesus was saying. The disciples, after they heard Jesus give this amazing Bible study, they said, did not our heart burn within us while we talked with him, while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Huh, that burning in your heart, what is that? That's the Holy Spirit teaching you, talking to you. So, that's very, very important to us. We want to have that burning in our hearts when we hear the words of Jesus in Revelation. Jesus began with Moses, then went through all the prophets, expounding in all the scriptures things about himself. So Jesus felt it necessary for his own disciples to build their faith on the scriptures. Right? Jesus could say, hey, I'm Jesus, just take me, you know, take me at my word. But he didn't do that. He says, I'm going to take you to the scriptures that you may believe in me. What did John see coming out of the sea? Okay, now we're going to get into some of those symbols we talked about. 
Revelation 13, verses 1 to 5. Revelation 13. We're jumping ahead a little bit. What did John see concerning this uh, coming out of, the, uh, out of the sea? Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if he had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power is given unto him to continue forty and two months. So, do you know what it's talking about? Well, you have to come back to know. <laughs> but you see, you know, if you've never read anything in the Bible and you just read this, you're like, my goodness, it's impossible to know what he means, right? What could possibly be the meaning of this beast? Well, let's see what the, the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation here actually is going to tell us what it means. Very easy. Then he said to me, this is Revelation 17, 15. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So that one was easy. Revelation itself is telling us what it means by the sea. What do the beasts represent in prophecy? Okay, now we're talking about prophecy in general. This scary beast. We go to the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel 7, 17. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So now we're using that principle of interpretation we talked about. If we don't understand what the beasts are supposed to mean in Revelation, we go to another book in the Bible that has beasts in it. And in that book, we're told in the book of Daniel that the beasts of Daniel represent four kingdoms. Now, we would call them the four governments, but the four kingdoms are the beasts. So, the book of Revelation is a book of, it's called the book of Revelation because it reveals things. It's not because it hides them. It's not because it is a sealed book. It is a book meant to uncover the plans that God has for you and me. Now, the believers in John's time, they would have understood the book of Revelation. This is important, right? God meant for it to be understandable. And that means that today, you and I can also understand the meaning of this book. If only we look at the scriptures and we ask God to give us the Holy Spirit to have an understanding. In the book of Hosea, Hosea, in verse 14, verse 9, it says, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. Now, are you wise? I'm not sure if I'm wise, but you know, there's another verse in the Bible that says, James 1.5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and he will be given to him. So what we want to do during this uh, series of presentations, we want God to give us that wisdom, because we said that it is only the Spirit who can teach us. It is only the Spirit that can reveal the meaning of Revelation. Therefore, we need to ask that God will give us wisdom and that we can go to the scriptures and really understand what Revelation means to us today. So, what are your thoughts from this first study? Is it scary? Are you afraid? Or do you feel confident that we can truly understand what Revelation has to say to us today? All right, we're going to take a short break, uh, 10 minutes. And then we're going to be back here for the next presentation. Thank you.